Hello everyone, uh, let me welcome you to the lecture called Critical Care, Architecture and Urbanism for the Broken Planet by Professor Elke Krásny. I am Terezia Lokšová, urban sociologist based at Institute of Sociology of the Czech Academy of Science, and I will moderate this event. The talk is part of the lecture series called No More Architecture, which focuses on the growth in architecture. The series is created by Karolina Pláškova and produced by Romana Tomáškova. Organizationally, it's collaboration between Brno Gal Gallery of Architecture uh, and Faculty of Architecture at Brno University of Technology. The series is financially supported by Ministry of Culture. Now, I would like to introduce you today's speaker, Elke Krásny. She is Professor for Art and Education at the Academy of Fine Arts Vienna. She is a cultural theorist, urban researcher and curator. Her scholarship and her curatorial work focuses on critical practices in architecture, urbanism and contemporary art. She addresses the interconnectedness of ecology, economy, labor, memory and feminisms. If you like today's lecture and if you want to explore the topics more, uh, then you can have a look at, for example, uh, the volumes Critical Care, Architecture and Urbanism for a Broken Planet, which was co-edited with Angelika Fitz, or In Reserve, The Household, which it was co-edited uh, with Regina Bit Bittner. Or you can also alternatively have a look at Elke's website, elkekrasny.at. First, uh, there will be the presentation of Elke, and afterwards we will discuss selected points together with the questions that we gather. So now the floor is yours, Elke. Well, thank you so much for inviting me and for making me part of this uh, lecture series with the very uh, provocative title, No More Architecture, even though we are all speaking or I will be speaking about, about architecture, but maybe not architecture as business as usual. But the Fitz and myself and, and also others have been doing um, around care. So I will try to share my screen and um, hope that we will get this to work. So Critical Care, Architecture and Urbanism for a Broken Planet was an exhibition held at the Architecture Center in Vienna in 2019. And it was based on a long-term research interest and also research project on what to take care um, of the environment, of human beings and of more than humans um, within the architectural profession might mean. Angelika Fitz, who is the director of the Architecture Center, and myself used care as a um, proposition and also as a critical lens or um, theoretical perspective to examine architecture. So it's not about a new style in architecture or a specific uh, typology, but uh, looking at the ethical and political dimensions of what architecture can do rather than what architecture represents. Um, I will start with an image that circulated in the year 2015 in order to resituate uh, the beginnings of our research in the year when we began doing research in order to also point out that we are always as researchers and scholars situated and um, maybe some of us more than others trying to notice what is going on in the real world, in the so-called life worlds, and how we can respond to our contemporaneity um, with what we are doing research on. So all this to say, if I were to start the project on critical care today, I would necessarily have to look at the conditions of the pandemic and of COVID-19 which was not the case in 2015 when Angelica and I were very much um, paying close attention to the notions of um, climate catastrophe, uh, the sixth mass extinction, 
and also uh, a lot of vocabulary that has been uh, not just vocabulary but um, developing vocabulary referencing real world um, uh, conditions and events taking place that are important to the discussions around degrowth that were mentioned before. And this is an image uh, of the climate protests in um, Paris and it is a very touching image because it shows that at a time of climate crisis uh, in a city where demonstrations were forbidden because of the recent terrorist attacks, uh, people still try and try to find agency, so a term that is very dear and important to uh, Jewish German thinker Hannah Arendt, and agency um, as being able to act politically is something that um, Angelica and I connected to notions of, of caregiving and practicing care uh, in the built um, dimensions of architecture and what is also often referred to as the built environment. Um, this, as I said before, was a research project, an exhibition, and um, also, as Teresia also mentioned, a publication, an edited volume uh, with many different contributors from different research fields, environmental humanities, architecture, um, but also um, 21 examples of architectural practices that Angelica and I uh, understood to be care practices. Two terms that I find relevant to introduce in order to speak about the complexities, the crises, the contradictions, but also the conflicts uh, connected to care are uh, Anthropocene and Capitalocene. They, they are two different terms um, speaking of um, the condition of the planet in the 21st uh, century, going back to those conditions as they were created by anthropogenic impact uh, due to industrialization. And while the Anthropocene stresses uh, with the Greek term Anthropos um, for man, that uh, climate is man-made and that um, this term Anthropocene was introduced as a new geological era or a new um, geological uh, period by um, atmospheric chemists um, Kruzen, um, the capitalocene calls out, uh, if you will, culprit, uh, the economic system that actually was behind um, the disastrous conditions in which um, the development uh, since industrialization has resulted. And as we are living in the um, uh, capitalist ruins, as Anna Tsing has um, called it, anthropologist Anna Tsing has described and called it, um, the question is, how can we build and make architecture differently? With architecture, of course, having been entangled with or even driving uh, or building capitalism. Anna Tsing, as, as I already mentioned before, was an important um, point of reference for Angelica Fitz and myself. In 2016, she gave a lecture that was subsequently published as an essay called Earth Stalked by Man. And here she references man uh, with capital M as the Anthropos in Anthropocene and also criticizes this because it's not all human beings in the same way that are responsible or share the, risk, the vicarious responsibilities uh, for the past but it's of course um, industrialization, enlightenment man and the very specific hold on nature, uh, configuring nature as a resource to be exploited uh, that uh, the Anthropocene condition was created by. And here she writes that uh, industrialization has proved far more deadly to life on earth than its designers might ever have dreamed. Dominated by the interests of capital, architecture and urbanism are caught up in the crisis, caught up in the meaning of having contributed to it, but also caught up in it as trying to counteract um, against this. Um, one of the theorists uh, who was very important, instrumental to developing a perspective of care 
on the built environment and on architecture is Joan Tronto, uh, who together with Berenice Fisher in 1990 provided this very general and very broad definition of what care is. So conventionally in everyday language, particularly before the COVID-19 um, global outbreak, um, when hearing care, people might have thought of health care or might have thought of child care, or maybe they may have thought of reproductive labor. But as we uh, can see here, the definition the two theorists Fisher and Toronto give is much broader. They write, on the most general level, we suggest that caring be viewed as a species activity that includes everything we do in order to maintain, continue and repair our world so that we can live in it as well as possible. That world includes our bodies, ourselves and our environment, all of which we seek to interweave in a complex life-sustaining web. And in particular, the second sentence of this quote caught my attention because architecture sits at the interconnectedness of bodies and environment. It's, it's part of the environment, it shapes the environment, but of course it also creates an environment for human bodies to find themselves in and to be cared for on an everyday level. And so I think this dual responsibility um, for human life and for the environment is precisely what makes care such an interesting perspective in order to develop it to critically investigate, but also critically practice architecture. A term that has caught a lot of traction in um, care theory, care scholarship across many different disciplines, including uh, environmental humanities, anthropology, sociology, political science, is interdependence. So understanding that um, as we always depend on care, but also always uh, in different ways um, contribute to caregiving um, and also struggle, so parenthesis, struggle for care or think that we are entitled to have access to care, uh, we are interwoven with other beings in interdependence. And um, with regard to architecture, the interdependencies between economy, the economic system within which architecture is being produced, uh, the question of ecology, how architecture is embedded within the environment, and questions of um, the distribution of labor are extremely relevant both in making architecture, but as I said before, in researching. So I, I like to entertain this dual perspective of practicing architecture as care, but also using care as a lens to examine um, care in, in scholarship. We assembled 21 case studies for the 21st century. So with this perspective of care, Angelica Fitz and myself were not interested in um, utopian practices. So in practices that um, imagine um, something to be possible that might never be realized. But we took care as something that is needed on an everyday practical level, has to be provided for, um, has to be felt that it is there uh, in order to be relied on. And therefore we gathered together 21 case studies that have been built that exist, that have been um, tested, and if you will, um, have to uh, ongo in their ongoing and continued existence prove that they um, will provide for care on an everyday basis. We structured the exhibition in a number of different chapters. The first one called Care for Water and Land. And um, in the exhibition, we um, used keywords under these different chapter titles in order to highlight uh, specific questions that are being addressed in the case studies that we brought together. Uh, here, for example, land speculation, rising water levels and floods, access to clean water, scarcity of water, but also increasing sealing of the ground. 
and I will not go in this in this lecture. I will not go in detail into the different um, case studies that I chose to um, bring together in the lecture. Uh, there is more information to be found on them in 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 the book that was already mentioned. Um, so I will only um, briefly present them as said. Uh, the first example is uh, in Gaibanda, Bangladesh, uh, finished, completed in 2012. It's called the Friendship Center, and it was designed by Kashef Mabub Chaudhuri with his architectural practice Urbana. And it's one of the case studies that has been shown in um, architectural exhibitions quite often. It has been photographed by Ivan Bahn, uh, one of the most important architectural photographers worldwide. And it has attracted attention for its architectural qualities. Um, and I'm stressing this because um, it wasn't theorized before under the aspect of care. Uh, and I'm also stressing the aspect that it had circulated on Instagram, but also on architectural publications in exhibitions before in order to underline that what Angelica and I did here in curatorial terms is bring uh, projects together that had been noticed in the architectural uh, community and by architectural experts before, but also pra practices that hadn't been included in architectural discourse or urban planning before being included in our exhibition. Uh, the, um, uh, Friendship Center is an NGO, uh, the client is an NGO that focuses on education, on AIDS prevention, on health issues. So very often when we think about uh, who commissions architecture and who is the client, the question of care also comes into play when we, thinking, when we are thinking about the co commissioning, um, the responsibilities in commissioning architecture. The Friendship Center uh, works with the flood, which we can see very well here in section. So it did not um, build raised uh, dams or platforms as is very much commonly done in Bangladesh in order to protect buildings from the flood, but rather it conceived of this um, in order to make the water with flooding occurring regularly. Um, so the floods are um, to be expected. They are not the exception. The water to go through these different basins, which we can see here in the um, aerial view. The second example is uh, located in San Juan, Puerto Rico, uh, the Caño Martin Peña example. And that, in contrast to the first example from Bangladesh, had not been discussed or um, shared in architectural media and um, um, architectural publications. Mm -hmm. uh, we were made aware of this project uh, by an Australian um, urbanist uh, who had met with Brazilian activists who were actually learning um, from this example in San Juan, Puerto Rico, um, because this is the first time that the model of the CTL, the Community Land Trust, no, CLT, Community Land Trust, uh, was for the first time used for an entire neighborhood. So it wasn't just used for individual um, objects, but for the whole part um, of a city. And it's also a very good example uh, for what we might uh, want to call traveling knowledge, how there are transnational activist links in sharing knowledge and, and making um, care work at all scales. So care in architecture, not just at the scale of an architectural project working with the environment, like with the floods and um, human needs, um, as in the last example, but also at the scale of the urban scape. Um, this image here, the first image we are looking at, um, when we look at it with the eyes of urban scholars, we can actually quite easily understand that there is major threat of gentrification encroaching on uh, what we see in the foreground 
which is the informal part of San Juan uh, that dates back to the 1930s and um, is the informally settled part of the city. Uh, in the background, there is the much younger financial district. And um, the relation between the two makes understood that the pressure on land is increasing because with the vicinity of the financial district, the value of the land on which these informal houses had been built in the past is um, increasing. And it also um, makes the people who live there more vulnerable, vulnerable to um, being enticed to giving up their homes um, and to then give up the land. Of course, as in all uh, informal or um, incrementally informally grown parts of cities, the land doesn't uh, rightly or legally, I should say, belong to the people who live in these houses. And this is where the community land trust principle um, intervened into the existing um, lawscape. Um, so what the actual CARE Act here is, is a new law that turned the entire land of all these communities into commonly held, which means that no, that the, the land is owned by all these um, seven communities in perpetuity and that no piece of land can be sold. So it's effectively taken out of um, um, capitalist market of um, ownership and prevents the commodification um, of land. The second element that has much to do with ecology, and we see it very well here in the um, aerial view, um, is the San Juan River, and this river was very much in need of ecological repair. And um, inadvertently, ecological repair projects often um, lead to um, gentrification, even though that wasn't the original or may not have been the original intention. And so here, the coming together of a large scale ecological repair and the new law that prevented people from losing their homes and from being dispossessed is what we identified as a long-term perspective on care. So temporality um, and commitment to long-term care is another one of these important perspectives when investigating care given by architecture. The images I'm sharing here were shared with Angelica and myself by um, from from the archives um, of local activists, so not any official archive. Um, so in contrast to the uh, Ivan Baun photography, here we are looking at um, snapshots and um, in curatorial terms, we in a way risked um, to combine very different types of photographic um, materials or standards in one exhibition. And the people uh, we see in the images are community leaders, community activists who work on ecological repair, but also on forms of um, social businesses, community businesses that, that may even link more to the theme of degrowth under which this lecture series was being announced. Uh, the a section of the exhibition dealt with the question of repair. Again, like, like care, repair is a very broad term, but here we um, specifically investigated how architecture can take care of existing architecture and bring new meaning, new life, but also continued existence to um, building stock that is already there. 
and in particular the, the modern uh, legacies of the 1960s and also the 1970s uh, present um, challenges here, challenges in, term, in terms of um, prolonging the life of architecture, but also challenges in terms of uh, making these architectures conform with um, current demands when it comes to um, sustainability. The first example is uh, located in downtown Sao Paulo, and it, um, it is the building with the rooftop um, pool. And it was done by Paulo Mendes da Rocha, da Rocha. He is a Pritzker. Um, he, he won the Pritzker Prize uh, together with MMBB architects. And um, the client for this building is um, SESC. And um, SESC is um, the association of all the, the businesses in Brazil that are involved with um, trade and commerce and they dedicate a 1.5% um, uh, payroll tax um, to, to what we can uh, consider welfare, to health, to education, to culture. So this, uh, this SESC dates back to 1946, to a period in time after World War II, when in many different parts of the world, um, in the global north, but also in the global south, in the former East and in the former West, mechanisms of welfare were being introduced. And of course, the relation between welfare and care is another very uh, broad and extremely um, interesting topic to explore, but it's not the focus of this lecture here. All I wanted to point out is that SESC um, invests in welfare um, of its employees, but also in public welfare. And um, here, um, the architects turned an existing uh, building from the 1960s, which was the headquarter of a department store in the um, fairly complex and, and um, at times dangerous um, downtown neighborhood in, in Sao Paulo into a publicly accessible building. Uh, and the section show here, shows here that there is um, access uh, on ramps, but also access on elevators. And each of the levels is um, dedicated to a specific function, such as a library, a theater, a cinema, um, a canteen, offering um, food um, at, at a very affordable price, um, dental services, health services, um, um, sports facilities and um, and the pool on the top. Not all of these are accessible by the public. So the, the pool and also the healthcare facilities are for the employees and their families, but the canteen, the library, the exhibition part is accessible to the general public. And what is particularly um, interesting is that uh, all the ventilation is natural with the architects having taken out the side walls and that it's something like a very generous interior public space in a in a neighborhood that is um, fraught with unevenness but also a neighborhood uh, with a lot of squatted buildings um, inhabited by refugee populations amongst other populations and um, the people who are working at the SESC building are actually forging alliances with the squatted, um, with the squatters and the, the people living in the squatted buildings in order to understand how this amenity of the public space where no uh, consumption is required um, can be shared um, with, with many different um, people coming in and uh, providing access that is not barred by security measures. So I could, I would say, the per so when I visited, what I was particularly impressed with is the the generosity of a public interior or a public um, interior public uh, space, 
and and very often I think we think of public space as something being outdoors, but thinking about um, the indoors as a public environment is is a very interesting um, question in terms of care. The second example that Angelica and I chose with regard to existing building stock is the transformation of 530 dwellings in the Cité du Grand Parc in Bordeaux, France, and uh, this was done by Lacaton Vassal together with Frédéric Trouillot and Christophe Hutin. This is also a project that was very much uh, recognized, was awarded the Mies van der Rohe Award and shows um, that generosity working with the existing, defining the qualities uh, that are already there and expanding them for a future in environmental and social terms can be done. So the photograph that we see here actually shows that best what, what happened here that um, to the existing building stock an extra layer was added, which um, is at the same time an, um, a buffer, um, climatic buffer zone, but also um, a, a layer of added space. Um, that is being used um, as uh, winter gardens, but but also uh, for for whatever people uh, choose to do with it. And uh, of course, that was not foreseeable that something like a global pandemic would be um, would be happening. But but I think that this extra space that was added here will have proven very valuable for people uh, in pandemic times. Um, I'm just looking at the time. So um, the another chapter that that uh, Angelica and I opened in the discussion of care is how um, architecture can also care for the developing of skills. Uh, and we located the skill development uh, in environments where uh, disasters are recurring where architects are actually um, pushing back against negative side effects of the international aid industry as it is entangled with the globalized construction industry and also counteracts um, lack of education, um, injustices and, and discrimination. And uh, the example that we presented in this, or one of the examples we presented in this section is uh, by Yasmin Lari together with the Heritage Foundation of Pakistan in the Sindh region in Pakistan ongoing since 2010. Yasmin Lari is um, the first um, female architect in Pakistan who opened her own practice. Um, she studied um, at the Oxford Architecture School uh, in the 1960s, then she returned to Pakistan. And her change, the change in her architecture, um, I find really remarkable. So she started out um, as doing um, large scale, um, concrete based, very beautiful, modernist, brutalist architecture. Uh, her work was included in the SOS Brutalism um, exhibition. And then uh, as of 2010, she had already, um, she had actually already retired from architecture. But with the um, um, flood disasters happening, she asked herself what she as an architect could, what she as an architect could contribute um, to counteract um, the ruination and uh, catastrophes um, that were happening because of the floods. And so together with a number of women-run NGOs, she started to develop a, a system where people learn how to self-build in a flood-resistant and sustainable way um, where women, can um, learn how to become teachers for teaching others how to build. So generating um, a system of, of income, um, which Nari names barefoot entrepreneurs, and also teaching women how to make bricks, um, how to uh, fabricate um, tiles and bricks locally, 
uh, in order to um, strengthen local economies. But as I said before, also to not to be dependent upon the international aid industry, which is often um, vulnerabilizing um, local production. So not just harmful in terms of the environment, but also harmful in terms of um, social networks, social ecologies. Um, and um, here architecture nourishes the skills of particularly women um, in order to make it possible for them to generate um, an economic basis, but also to have homes that will protect them in, ter in times of flood. And um, now Larry is currently working on uh, CO2 reduction in uh, these outdoor stoves. Uh, so what she strives to achieve is um, CO2 zero um, architecture. So her lifespan in architecture covers um, CO2 rich architecture and the turn to CO2 neutral or um, CO2 poor architecture. Um, we also looked at how architecture can care for production under the conditions of neoliberal capitalism, exploitation, precarization, unemployment, and how architecture can help prevent um, the rural exodus and uh, the um, the mass migration to the metropolis. Um, one of the examples we included here is located in Nairobi, Kenya, and it's ongoing since 2006. So also like the last example, which is ongoing since 2010, with Larry still continuing to work, not all of the examples, but many of them we included in this exhibition and in the book, are examples of architectural practices that are long-term and that work with um, area or site um, for a long period of time. And the Kibera Public Space uh, by Kunkai Design Initiative is one such example where um, they identified um, public space as ecologically unsafe space but also as a safe, um, as an unsafe space because of crime, in particular um, sexual crime, um, sexual violence, harassment of women, but also as a space um, where people need access to um, um, basic um, sanitary provisions uh, like public toilets. So identifying what is needed in order to make space accessible, to make it, um, to clean it up and provide for ecological repair, but also turning it uh, into uh, an amenity where people then can have um, local food production and uh, sell their produce locally. So again, we have this complex, um, interweaving of social and ecological needs and demands, which um, is at the heart of uh, architecture as a care giving, care providing practice. Uh, here we see uh, an image of uh, students participating in the planning of their local school and the public space connected to their school. Um, here we see an image before the cleaning up um, and then afterwards. So Kunkai Design Initiative works a lot with before and after images in order to show what the spaces looked like before and what the collaboration with um, the local communities um, made possible in terms of transformative power of architecture and building. And the last example I'm showing um, is by Anna Heringer, in, uh, who works in Bangladesh, Bangladesh since 2012. It's called This Is Not A Shirt. And uh, it was also included in the Venice Biennale 2012, so also a project that was um, recognized by the architectural community, even though it is not 
um, architecture as usual. As we all know, Bangladesh is one of the um, um, low wage countries um, where a lot of textile um, production takes place in order to be sold in the, in the global north. And starting from the observation of the precarious conditions in connected to the um, textile industry, A, in terms of workplace security, and B, in terms of mostly women uh, leaving behind their families and migrating to cities in order to work um, in factories. So this was starting from the given, as, as care always needs to do, and starting from an analysis of the given, Anna Heringer, together with her local um, collaborators, then went on to um, bring back the economy or take back the economy uh, locally. Uh, so that was one step. So, so not working for the um, um, globalized, industrialized textile industry, but, um, but producing locally. And the other turning around or the other uh, strategic intervention following from the analysis is that they um, use um, used local textiles. So they use used saris and, and other textile materials in order to um, speech marks upcycle them uh, for um, a market uh, where things are being sold on the terms of those who are the producers. And what we see here is that this project works with, um, with uh, a project area connecting together uh, possibilities for raw, finding raw materials, um, connecting houses and, and uh, working at home, but also facilities for uh, groups of women working together and also um, investing in education and schooling um, of providing and nourishing skills. And these are the, the last images um, I'm sharing. Um, and some of them were also, as I said before, included in the Venice Biennale. Um, this is just an image to show what the exhibition looked like when it was shown in the Architecture Center in Vienna. And it's currently traveling and will be opening in Zurich in um, March, hopefully, when, if, if pandemic conditions allow. Um, this is the book, Critical Care, Architecture and Urbanism for a Broken Planet, that was published with MIT Press. And just to, to stress one more time, it's not about a style, it's not about uh, typology, but it's about developing a care perspective in architecture um, for practicing architecture, but also for analyzing and studying architecture. Um, care, as John Tronto has um, told us to observe, always starts with the given. So it's not like the, the colonial terra nullius approach or the modernist approach uh, to the green lawn, that there was nothing there before and then architecture was being built, but that there is always already something there that has to be taken into account uh, because architecture is implicated in the given um, historically, but also involved with and responsible for what is happening with the given. And uh, understanding better the uh, complex interdependence um, between economy, ecology, and labor, and working um, maybe in something that we paradoxically, we, Angelica and I, called repair the future. So to understand that the future is not this bright time uh, when everything will be better, but that the future is um, the con only the continuance of our present time if uh, as, as planetary collective, we will work um, for caring for repairing the future in order to have um, a future and futurity. And with this, I would like to um, to close the lecture part, and I'm I'm looking forward to our discussion. Yeah, thank you for the lecture. 
Uh, I was very happy that you presented a uh, very solid insight full of theoretical framing and background and that you didn't resort only to the case studies as I think it's uh, often the usual way in the architectural transfer of knowledge. And so this is where I would like to start with my comments and questions with the theory with which you started and with which, which you uh, arrived to afterwards. Um, I really want to stress for the audience that I greatly enjoyed the, the, the lecture and also the book and the exhibition problematizes the varied dimensions of care and that it highlights their highly political nature, what to care about, how to care for it and who will do the actual work of care and then how to evaluate it afterwards. And uh, I really appreciate how each case study shows what became the main concern and values and that it was uh, often quite different in various cases, uh, what was at stake. And uh, so that uh, we were not somehow implying collectively uh, what the, that there would be some fixed values, uh, which would be the matter of concern, but it really depends on the context. And uh, well, first of all, um, as you also wrote in the, um, in the abstract, uh, the lecture started with uh, the evaluation that we li live in the ruins of the modernist promise. And it also was uh, present uh, in, in some of the cases. And uh, I agree that uh, the era of the better future as we knew it, uh, is now the modernist premise, which is somehow out of the question, even though we still have some cases like Elon Musk, uh, who still wants to colonize the Mars uh, and to, uh, to gather new resources there. But uh, you are calling uh, for this to, to be outdated and you call for the care for the repair. And um, I personally have been uh, quite doubtful about the implication of the statement that what awaits us is the process of permanent repair. I mean, of course, I agree, but uh, also one of the key contemporary questions to me is how to motivate the various stakeholders to, you know, to join in the process of care and repair and uh, to motivate them to do the things. But when you motivate people for something, you know, slow, something not very promising and something which doesn't seem to be very optimistic, I'm not sure how this can work. So I've been pondering that uh, instant the attempts to, I've been pondering how to, how to reformulate what the better future means because the former promise of the modernist well-being seems to be uh, quite fixed in time, because as, at least as I understand it, it refers to the material well-being, the possibility to choose from abundance of products and services, living the comfortable life uh, with the abundance of material resources. But also, I think this modernist vision, uh, which is very materialistic, in, it corresponds to certain um, to certain point in time, which it was probably peaking at the 1970s, I guess. And uh, I think some of the societies may have passed onto the so-called post-materialist stage, as was coined by the sociologist Engelhardt. Uh, even though with the, with the growing inequality or with the examples from uh, various places in the world, um, we can still see that the material, the phase where the materiality is still very important, it's still not gone. But however, I was, um, I was thinking how we could uh, reformulate the prospect of the good future, that we would not retain just, uh, we would not just stay with the idea of uh, repairing, but we will still retain the idea of the good future which awaits us, only it could have different contents, contents. So I'm thinking whether you personally have been considering this uh, reframing or um, recontextualizing of the future, and also whether some of the cases which you have been uh, studying 
if they worked with the idea of the future. Well, thank you for the really complex, um, the really complex question. What, what, what is the value that we um, give to the future, and how do we work with, on one hand, not being able to take the the future for granted? So, so that there are a lot of dystopian voices um, who then may intentionally or inadvertently actually uh, contribute to the rising of extremism or to um, to populism by by saying that um, that this um, dystopia means that that uh, we can't do anything we want today so actually exacerbating and anything goes mentality and on the other hand restoring um, optimism, if I understand you correctly. I mean, how can we restore some kind of optimism? And I have to think about this um, doubt you are having um, for the relationship between repair and um, and optimism. So, so I guess in everyday language, uh, repair is not very sexy. Um, so it's not... Um, to, to just repair something um, might seem tedious or um, always leave us with the imperfection that something that has been repaired is not as good as new um, and will still show the scars um, or the, the wounds of the past. Um, so, so I think um, one way of thinking about repair is um, is taking on the implications of the legacies that were there before us. Um, so that as architects, um, starting from the given, we cannot pretend that these things weren't there. And I tried to say something about the optimism that you want me to speak about. Um, I would say that a, a good deal of optimism is um, is being needed in order not to give in or to give up to, to the demands um, of business as usual. So carving out conditions, I mean, coming back to, to the field we are talking about, to architecture, insisting that it is actually possible to do architecture within um, the conditions of neoliberal um, capitalism with, without promoting those values or without um, um, only caring um, about what is um, being imposed um, as real estate value, um, but trying to, um, to make architecture responsibly, if you will. Um, so I would say that's where I would try to um, to increase the optimism for making the conditions of that possible. And, um, and that since a lot of people around the world are trying to work um, as critical architects, um, as critical urbanists in different ways, um, to actually um, understand better that this is not always an individual person fighting alone against these conditions, but that there are ways of um, finding optimism in the work of others um, that, that is actually out there um, and that in a way provides living um, testimony of things that can be, even though they are against all the odds um, against them. So I think this is how I would um, maybe try to answer that. And then from a personal standpoint, having been in education for a long time, I think that thinking about what architecture schools actually teach and how they teach and, and how it might be really valuable to look at um, models of degrowth, um, circular economies, 
a much deeper understanding of what materials are, how they are being produced, what they do in architecture. So knowing the making of architecture differently um, in order to instill optimism um, that architecture can become not just normatively a sustainable practice, but one that actually um, becomes um, sustainable, um, not just in the norms that very often benefit the norms of the global north. Um, I think this is something where um, insisting on knowing the practice of architecture differently, building a different canon, if you will, um, but also different practices is something that I'm not always pessimistic about, to mm -hmm. put it like that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, this is uh, what you mentioned about the education of the architects. Uh, this is something I came across when I was doing research for this discussion to prepare myself. And uh, I've been thinking as architecture um, being something designed by the architects who get educated at the architecture schools. But uh, then I learned something which quite surprised me. and. Uh, Okay, I don't want to put forward the pessimistic note again. Sorry, <laughs> sorry about that. It just it just happens. <laughs> but uh, in, it, I don't know how is it in Austria or in another context. But in Czech Republic, uh, I learned that the majority of the construction is uh, designed not by architects but by the construction engineers. Which is exactly the people who can, you know, who understand the materials. They can do the maps and things like that. And it's a very technological profession, and uh, it's done without the concerns uh, the architects are uh, brought up to raise. So I started to wonder uh, whether the debate, when we are talking about architecture, implying architects. Uh, whether it's not too narrow and how could we widen it so that it contains a much wider sphere of the built environment, of the production of the built environment, uh, so that we can include the engineers, but uh, probably um, also the investors play a very important role, as you've been yourself mentioning it in the, in the case studies, who is behind the projects and so on. So have you been thinking about this, how the debate should be, uh, should be shaped so that it uh, involves much wider sphere? Yeah, I think it's really important what you're raising. I mean, that um, the, the complexity of um, care and the complexity of um, climate care, human care, um, care for more than humans, um, cannot just be understood by, by one um, speech marks discipline, but it needs many different um, knowledges in plural. And the ways in which these knowledges can come together in times um, of 24-7 um, uh, mentality and of um, fast track production in all, in all, um, in all professions, I think is, is, is a much larger question than, than just the question concerning, um, concerning architects. I guess what makes the profession of architecture interesting in this discussion it is that it so broadly sits between all these different fields, uh, between um, engineers, uh, material experts, um, clients, um, individuals with interests, um, developers, um, economists, um, construction workers, um, public administrators. So, so being in this network of knowledges and how to um, navigate this, I think it, it again leads us back to architectural education. How are architects um, Pre how can architecture students prepare themselves during their studies in order to um, be listened to, to have a voice that um, can reason and argue, um, and but also develop uh, maybe more humble perspective on the 
on the limits of their own knowledge in order to know when to bring other expertise in. So, so I guess um, com complexity can only be dealt with in a complex way. It's, it, there is never a simple answer to, to something that is extremely complex. And um, carving out conditions of work that allow for more time um, and, and for more engagement with existing knowledge um, rather than this claim for permanent innovation. I think this is something where in a very from an oblique angle, maybe degrowth can also be addressed. So, so not to roll out the, the innovation um, obsession, but to understand that, that um, innovation might lie in bringing together differently what is already there. Mm -hmm. no, I was just looking at the chat at the same exactly. time. Exactly. Yeah, now um, Karolina Plaškova is asking, so we can continue with this question. She asks how to reach more people other than only those already concerned with these issues. Yeah, I think that the time we are living in uh, with pandemic conditions and climate catastrophe, there are really a lot of people concerned with these issues in their in their everyday lives already. And and in some um, very urgent way, the way people are being housed or or don't have a home or have enough space to have the home office at home. So all the things that have to do with um, leading one's life in something that is built, in, 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 in something that has um, to do with, with architecture. So, so maybe not with architecture with capital A, but in something that, that is um, a building, I think has actually deepened um, the awareness for, for what uh, Carolina asked. So, so I guess people are very much touched by these issues or are very much living them in their everyday um, life. But that doesn't necessarily mean that these issues like um, um, Maria Puig de la Bella Casa in following uh, arguments brought forward by Bruno Latour has argued are already matters of concern and matters of care. So, so I guess this um, building on the fact that there is a, a profound everyday knowledge, but maybe not um, a concern with how change might come about is, is maybe what, what this intersection is. How to reach more people? Um, I don't think a single person, unless you are really a worldwide media influencer person, is is someone who can answer this question in this um, in these strange economies of attention um, that perforate what people think about. And um, I'm not sure I have an answer to this. Um, Maybe I would rephrase the question a little bit. How to reach people differently um, and to trust that once they are touched by what they are concerned with, um, that they will multiply this knowledge, but that's maybe a very naive way of answering this. No, I think I'm well aware that uh, I myself I'm asking questions to which I'm not having answer right because it's it's too overwhelming at times, and I'm also this is maybe more of a comment because I'm thinking that I'm not sure how much I trust in the in the power of the people bottom up in this sense when it comes to the huge reconstruction projects given that uh, there's this capital scene. And uh, and the the resources are held in the by the one percent of the population, and uh, then there's a vast uh, stretch of people who are fighting to get a get a decent housing, and uh, I'm not sure how empowered they are to make a change, but. Uh, 
or this brings me to another question which somehow touches what you what you mentioned uh, the interconnectedness of the economy ecology and labor and the importance of re reconfiguring the relationship between the labor in the interest of capital and the non-capitalist labor because i think it seems to be obvious that the um that the labor interest of capital is what brings us to the situation of uh, mm. people not having that much power and that we need to reconsider the relationship between productive and reproductive labor mm. and uh, there has been in the background the idea of responsibility and the responsabilization of the involved actors and whereas i'm not really sure how how successful we can be in um, responsabilization of the investors and the big developers i i, I really don't know maybe maybe you have an idea but uh, you are in the in the case studies you've been talking about the local people about the inhabitants about the local ngos sometimes it was also um, pu local public actors mm -hmm. and uh, i wonder whether you have um, if you came across it in some cases whether you could elaborate uh, how these people can get responsabilized because I think quite often we are overloaded with work and squeezed between the life and work demands and uh, it's very hard to take up another responsibility to care about something more and be oh. responsible for that. Have the cases addressed it somehow? Another complex question. I'm still grappling with the last one, how to reach more people. Um, so, um, should, I don't know, should I re rephrase the question? No, 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 that's okay. fine. I just think how, how we can think these things together. I mean, how does one reach uh, more people, including those specific stakeholders that you just mentioned? I mean, how, how does one... Um, raise awareness on on a level um, that includes all kinds of people, if you will. Um, so from um, urban developers to concerned neighbors to um, to citizens who um, who want to have a say, um, but then on the other hand, find themselves oftentimes in a situation where the domination of um, power and capital is so overwhelming that it doesn't seem feasible to do things differently. And going back to the, the projects that we collected in the exhibition, but also many other projects that exist in the real world, I think it's a coming together of multiple agencies. So it's it's not just grassroots um, and it's, it's not just um, one developer and it's not just one person in the public administration but it's always a constellation of agencies embodied by actors who join their forces in order to make something happen and um and it's a lot of work um, so I would say these projects they, they don't just take um architectural design labor as all architectural projects but they take a lot of uh, work when it comes to communication and to communicating with these different actors in order to um, understand how how things can be done so they create a maybe brackets fragile, but a different kind of coexistence between ecologies and, and social needs. And so I would say reaching, so I'm going back to what was written in the chat. Um, so the, the question of how to, how to reach um, and turn issues into something people are concerned with um, along the way, um, I think this is um, this is where the work um, takes place and it needs, as you were saying yourself, um, dedication 
and I think a lot of optimism and a lot of um, insistence um, and a very strong belief in its own possibility um, so, so that, that it actually um, does make sense to, to not um, give up or to not take the easy, uh, the easy way out. I mean, a lot of the architectural practices included in, in the book, I would say, have um, diverse economies in their offices. So they might have uh, some projects that are more business as usual, some projects that are really long term, some projects that are NGO based, um, different types of financing coming together. So this concept of um, of diverse economies, and I think you were alluding to it um, when you were speaking about how productive and reproductive labor has to come together in a different way. But I think also understanding reproduction in this other sense, I mean, in this uh, Gramscian sense, so not just reproduction as how Marx defined it, that bodies or angles, and in, in the wake of them, um, feminist Marxists, that our bodies and our labor power need to be reproduced but also that our systems are being reproduced by what we do. And, and if we understand that architecture can in, can in fact be reproductive in the sense of being restorative, but can resist to reproduce the system as is. So I think this in this complex uh, redefinition of what reproduction is, I would actually see the best way um, forward in this predicament that we find ourselves in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been, this is something I've been thinking about how the, um, um, when, when you uh, show that some of the cases are long term, uh, something was running from the 2006, right, which is very impressive. And I think it very well aligns with what you what you write in the book that the care is about the process and relationships, and not merely about the thing which uh, that the project would end with uh, with the building as it is done, and that also the project stretches in space and time, and. Uh, this, this seems to me uh, where the multiplic multiplicity of authors come in, uh, of actors, not authors, come in, because it cannot, it doesn't seem realistic to me that it would be only the architects who could, uh, you know, uh, follow the project for such a long time, but that also the um, the another stakeholders come and take over. Is that right? Or is it the architect still uh, still not in charge, but involved in the projects you mentioned? Yeah, I think involved is a really good word. So how to stay involved with, with your projects. I mean, not all of them need your, like the architect's involvement um, forever. But to understand that um, architecture has or the life of architecture also in a specific way begins when when it's not when the when the building in a way is finished or the construction um, process is finished, and to understand the life of architecture with those who live with it uh, and making that part of your um, professional remit, if you will, I think this is what a lot of these projects do to understand that um, you can actually learn from the life of your project in order to then bring this knowledge to other projects you're doing in, in, in the sense of understanding the potentials, the failures, um, the things to do different. So, so even though all of these projects are in and of themselves, of course, highly localized and highly situated and have to be understood in their locale and together with their local um, agents uh, and actors around them, there is still the possibility to abstract certain things of, out of this. And I think this is a lot what these um, architectural practitioners that we included in the exhibition also do with their own work. So they have, in a way, you could say a relationship of study to their own work. 
and and try to understand it um, in the sense of its um, capacity, um, in the sense of what it enables, and in the sense of what to take to to other projects. Um, and what you asked about about before, I mean, is there going to be a system change or um, are our developers actually going to change? Um, I mean, I don't think there's going to be a system change uh, like from very easily. Um, but on the other hand, if, if there is not the um, working for insistence on changing um, very likely, I'm coming back to the future, we won't have a future. So I think it's really, it's really necessary to be insistent um, on practicing in a way that is less harmful than, than other ways of, of practicing. Yes, to me, this sounds like a perfect wrap up of the of the presentation, but and the discussion. Uh, but are there any other questions from the audience? Not even Carolina. Okay, so uh, unless you want to add something to the discussion. Uh, I want to thank you for the lecture and also uh, for the answers to my uh, quite uh, pessimistic question. And dear viewers, uh, I'm really happy for being here with us. And I hope it was as insightful for you as it was for me. And I hope to see you on uh, some other lecture in the future. Thank you. Goodbye.